do you have like a favorite object that you ever printed uh well i would say it's almost certainly this ship. Mm -hmm. yeah um there's just there's so much of me in this i mean the design is something i copied from uh, an existing design in star trek but <clears throat> not to get too nerdy about it but nobody has ever done this ship justice um it, it's always been based on flawed reference material uh the okay. official models i have one of them up there you can just see in the corner of the shot uh same ship <laughs> but um that one the lines on it are just not right mm -hmm. uh there was an original studio model physical model built for the tv show that had a, a certain look about it and that was never replicated even when they switched to cgi uh, visual effects in the tv show they just kept getting it wrong mm -hmm. and it worked it was functional enough for the show and it was clearly the same ship and whatever but they, it was just slightly off mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so that always bugged me and then all of the merchandise that's ever been made of that ship has always been slightly off because of ah. that so i wanted to get as much um, reference together of the original studio model and replicate that as much as i could and i mentioned that i was like working on the source model for this so this is a prototype i realized that there's slight inaccuracies here and there so i i have to there's no choice i have to get it right <laughs> so that's that's definitely the passion project and the one that i'm proudest of however that's not finished yet and it has been um has been taking over for too long at this point mm -hmm. uh, i i had to shelve it for a while after i got the job initially because my workload just went way up and i couldn't sit there and then finish work and then work on the same software yeah. and yeah, the yeah. same tools and things so i just had to shelve it for a little while which i felt a little guilty about because i love the thing uh and i love working on it but i just you know, you know yourself. I just mm -hmm. had to stop at that point. I'm a big Star Trek fan, and I created this ship, um, designed it over the course of the last year or so, uh, and uh, I created it out of multiple parts so that I could add electronics to it and have it uh, light up and stuff. So it's not painted and finished yet, and I'm actually making a number of changes to the the model files. This is more of a pathfinder prototype than anything else but the point is that like this this is a large solid object that i have put batteries into i put wiring through it um i've come up with all sorts of little mechanical ways that it can connect together there's lots of like problem solving thinking that you go through to like create these objects so <sighs> for someone with an interest in science and technology with a creative streak and who enjoys problem solving i think it's a really rewarding um discipline to get into if that's the right word mm -hmm. uh, interest anyway and it can be a hobby but it can also be a, a, a living it can be something that will earn you your keep if you look at this print i don't know if it'll come up on camera but up close you can sort of see layer lines Mm -hmm. on that because this was printed sort of standing up um and so you get that kind of texture on things that uh can be undesirable you can deal with it with coatings and whatever but with a resin 3d printer those layer lines tend to be far less apparent because with these printers you're dealing with the color like obviously this is all one color yeah. because that is the color of the filament it was printed in now it is possible with some heavy modification and a lot of hassle to um to mix colors as you're printing uh it's not something i've experimented with and it's probably a, a path for improvement further down the line to make them more appealing to to, to home users and so on mm -hmm. just have a few different lines of film going in of different colors and you can mix and match as you need to but yeah that that's still uh, an area for development okay uh, incidentally the top layer of that may look different because I, I did paint that and i mean the this i think speaks for itself this is uh if you know star trek this ship is quite recognizable and uh i built the model for this myself so i was very exacting in my attention to detail on it and um i am super pleased with how that came out even with yeah. those visible layer lines it's just it just looks great looks very and, cool and it's, it's super solid like i can i can hold it by the the front end here which is actually a piece that slots in Nice. That I designed to slot in, and there's no um, no worries about that. So 
yeah uh so i i get to like work on um on the design thinking uh of these products which was the part that i enjoyed most about this uh, this is not the only example i have i've, I've done a, a few other products that i kind of put together from uh, from scratch and i will actually take this apart just to show you because I wanted this to be, uh, what's the term, user serviceable. Mm -hmm. And so most of the time you get these models and they'll be screwed together or you have to glue them together yourself. But I built in these little sprues here that I don't know if you can make it out, have a little bit of an S bend on the end. Mm -hmm. And so they slot into other sprues inside the lower half okay. that have S bends. And then everything just kind of it clicks together. together exactly yeah and so awesome. uh, so that was one of the like little mechanical problem solving elements that i really enjoyed so that's back together now and um you get to kind of do that in this case it was because it was an object i wanted to create and i wanted to have certain functionality and whatever but it doesn't matter if it's something you're doing as a passion project because you're you like the thing, or if it is a practical thing that uh, needs to fulfill certain requirements, there's the mm -hmm. same kind of enjoyment and satisfaction from uh, doing that mechanical problem solving. And so I get to do that with the educational kits that we're working on as well. What I wanted to produce is not a model kit, um, but a toy as such. Mm -hmm. That's why this one lights up because I wanted it to have, ooh, is that stuck? Ooh, I'll have to have a look at that. I wanted it to have play features. For example, uh, I am in the process of wiring up some weapons lighting ah. uh, that uh, will also have sound effects added as well. Awesome, man. Yeah. That, that looks like a really awesome. elaborate toy. Yeah, yeah. Um, How did you figure out the <laughs> wiring and the lighting? Uh, did you work on some things like that beforehand or is it everything just like learned it yourself? I very much learned it myself. Um, I did some custom work on some other Star Trek toys down through the years. Um, and it's just sort of um, bungling my way through and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And a lot of cases, uh, banging my head against the wall going, why isn't this working mm. until I figure out, oh, well, the solder didn't melt properly. And so the contact has been lost there and that oh. kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, th this is, uh, I'm missing a, a microchip actually, but they, I have a couple of chips in there. I want, oops, I wanted some lights to blink. I've lost mm -hmm. some buttons now, I'll have to pick them up. But um, so yeah, I went sourcing them from the internet and just looking up guides on YouTube as to how to work with them. Yeah, uh, that's how I would approach it. Like, um, I think it will take me too much time to figure all that stuff out and I'll probably go to a bunch of tutorials <laughs> on yeah. everything. Like yeah that's that's really all uh, all there is to it uh, the internet is such an incredible resource i mean not only for learning things but if you have a 3d printer you can go to the likes of thingiverse just search for like 3d model of whatever you want mm -hmm. and you can generally among the first uh, results even if you don't search for a printable model there will be a, a printable model available um so many of the items that i have printed for people have just been stuff that they have found on those sites and they need it printed and mm -hmm. so I, I would just go ahead and do that for them mm -hmm. um and indeed the, the case that i was talking about my friend who needed the cosplay item he found that model on a site purporting to be this item but when i looked at the the model and the reference there was just too much of a disparity there and my need for accuracy the same as i have with the ship would not allow me to print that item for him without doing a better job on it <laughs> <laughs> all, all of these little little design features that i have had to kind of uh work back into in first principles mm -hmm. and there's lots of and, and functional stuff like for example in this ship here uh the buttons that i have uh, wired up to make those lights and sounds come on and off i had to build a little caddy system for the buttons because in order to be able to wire the buttons in i couldn't have the uh, the contacts for them sandwiched down in the bottom of this trough here because i wouldn't be able to get at them with the soldering iron mm -hmm. so 
that necessitated redesigning this and coming up with a way to to have that slot in neatly and and there's all sorts of little uh clever solutions i suppose is, well they feel clever to me I, mean, I think they probably are clever uh but just unique ways of thinking about things mm -hmm. that it it prompts in you and then you start to appreciate that in everything else that you see uh that has been designed because we live in a very designed world you know the the little posts i was talking about these little s bend things i have never seen anybody use that design before for mm -hmm. this for this purpose uh, it just, just came to me just when hold the structure right yeah so it's just two s's two s shapes that just sit into one another mm -hmm. and it relies on them both being on posts so there's a little bit of play so that when they come together they will knock over each other and then slot into place yeah. and then they hold it together and it feels solid yeah and i just came up with that one day and i uh printed a little test piece to see what it would connect mm -hmm. and uh and it did and i was like oh yes <laughs> yeah patented. coming up patented. well there you Stop go the podcast. I, probably... Stop the podcast <laughs> this part out. yeah i'm just leaking ip <laughs> everywhere at the moment brendan you're gonna make millions like <laughs> <laughs> or somebody somebody else is gonna make millions on these ideas yeah, yeah, after yeah. watching the podcast that's the concern <laughs> engineer in china is like oh yes yeah. shape that's what we were missing <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it was just like, you come up with this idea and you think, will that work? I've never seen that before. But if that works, surely someone else has done that. And then you try it out and it works and it feels so good when it works. Mm. Um, it's great. Cool, awesome. Uh, I feel that... 3D printing gets um, allows people to kind of get that... Um, um, another dimension of their creativity to uh, unfold itself uh, because they start from not hard mass. They start from like a program and basically a picture in mm -hmm. 3D space on a computer. And there you don't have that many limitations, right? If you were start, if you point. started with uh, bolts and screws and pieces of metal, you, you might not even think about it because you couldn't bend the metal in a way that you wanted. And here you're in a yeah. program, you're like, oh yeah, let's just try this, right? And um, Can you, are, would you be able to let me share my screen? I just want to show you the sure. program I'm using. That was one of the questions that I actually wanted to ask. Uh, what are some of the programs where you can actually make the designs? Yeah, so any 3D package uh, is is good for this. There are uh, ones that are built into Windows that I haven't really tried myself, but I'm sure are pretty good. Um, I was, I'm was i using this one, which is called Blender, and it's free. Uh, and it's actually, it's it's been around for a very long time. and is chiefly used as a 3d animation package for like movies and tv um but uh i've been using this one simply because it's what i had when i started working on the um on the 3d print stuff and i had been using it for for modding a game making modifications to a computer game and just because it was available to me i started using this uh, so for everyone listening to the podcast, oh, yeah. um, Brendan is showing a 3D model of the ship that we mentioned earlier uh, from Star Trek. And uh, it's a picture underneath and there's a 3D yeah. model on top of it. So you were designing the 3D model based on the picture underneath that you got online, right? That's exactly right. So this mm -hmm. picture is um, it's just there for my own reference. I have it lined up. Uh, so that I can sort of turn the ship transparent and almost trace through it. But uh, it's chiefly there as, as a reference piece. And this picture, I should credit it, it's to a, um, it's credited to a, an artist on DeviantArt called Farshot. Mm -hmm. And I remember many years ago, it was actually, this was put together as part of a game modification as well. And he was similarly obsessed with uh, getting the studio model accurate shape of the Defiant. Uh, the, the name of the ship is the defined and uh, so I knew he had done that and I thought okay I can I can stand on his shoulders as such mm. but I've actually found uh, quite a number of things that he overlooked in his work there as well uh, not knocking his work at all because uh, I have benefited greatly from it but um, there's just a lot of smaller details that you might miss 
and mm -hmm. I'm in the midst of of remodeling my ship because of more details that I've noticed now. Mm -hmm. um, so and you can next... zoom in very uh, very much on in this program, right? You can go into yeah. all the de yeah yeah. So you can like you can work on individual lines and uh, and skew them around. So zoom in tight on that line and just like. If that's at the wrong angle, I can change that uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, and do it down onto the the nitty gritty level of each facet, literal facet of the ship. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that really jazzed me at the beginning, or not so much at the beginning, in the middle of this project, I suppose, when the, I first printed the prototype that I have here, was the thought that this came from literally almost well, i mean literally nothing um let me see I'll, I'll, yeah i'll change the window i'm sharing just so you can see some of my progress photos uh how do i do that i'll stop share no it really looks amazing and there's so many details uh i understand why if somebody was to make a toy out of this in traditional methods they would have to leave out a lot of uh details out uh but if you do it like this, where you can zoom in on all the details, you can really get a, a lot more um, authentic, you know, like uh, an, yeah. a lot more authentic design. And I'm sure that for uh, people who are collecting um, toys like that or, or memorabilia or uh, generally figures, uh, they really need the details to be on point. Um, and I think it means a lot to them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, there is... There are limitations in how a toy has been traditionally manufactured, um, particularly if you're talking about, like there's limitations in 3D printing as well, but you kind of work around them. And toy manufacturers down through the ages have been working around their limitations as well, but you still see them. Um, for example, the the ship I pointed to earlier, the, the, the commercially available one, or it was at one point commercially available, it's quite old now. It has screw holes, it has, um, various artifacts of it being uh, a traditionally manufactured item. And uh, you can kind of get around those to a certain extent with 3D modeling. But the other factor is that uh, that was made by uh, the employee of a toy company who may not have been an obsessive Star Trek fan mm -hmm. as much as I am, for example. In fact, I know that that particular one, uh, they borrowed the molds from another company that had also made a, a model kit of the ship. Mm -hmm. and base their toy molds on those. And so that's uh, a second generation copy of inaccurate reference to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that said, that was made back in the 90s. Uh, we live in a world where we're able to access a lot more of this kind of information. Uh, so I don't blame them really for getting it wrong at all. It's just because I'm an obsessive nerd, <laughs> I need to yeah. get it right. <laughs> But I wanted to show you this, uh, these these screenshots that I have here, just to give you an idea. This is how the ship started. I, uh, and this is actually a little bit after I started working on it, that I thought to take some screenshots and actually document what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But literally, all it was to begin with was a cylinder, hmm. uh, and and I, I kind of snapped the the lines that made up the cylinder in different places to pull them out into different 3D shapes and uh, and started adding more detail to it, as you can see here, and a little bit more, and on and on until I was... Yeah, getting... now it looks like a proper ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it kind of evolves as you work on it. And mm -hmm. then I endlessly tweaked it for months as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it was super... Like, I don't regard myself as a particularly talented... Uh, 3D modeler. And so... I, it, dude, this looks amazing. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> 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 and that's the point. Like, I don't regard myself as a great 3D modeler, but then I see what I created and how satisfied I am with it. And it, it just gives me such a thrill. It really mm -hmm. does. Like, I cannot believe that. And this is what I was getting to, that after evolving the ship from a cylinder to this highly detailed replica of the Starship Defiant from Deep Space Nine, it um, it was kind of stunning to me 
to see it emerge from the 3D printer and think I handcrafted every polygon of that 3D model and now it's now it's emerging from the 3D printer. Yeah, amazing. And, uh, um, we'll we'll definitely leave a uh, link for everyone uh, just listening on the podcast site to take a look at the pictures that Brandon designed. Uh, some of them are like already with the background shaped into deep space so it really looks mm-hmm. like a real spaceship and uh and once i had the exterior uh structure of it designed and i'm scrolling down for the sake of the listeners i'm scrolling down through the album of photos there are or not photos but screenshots there are many pictures here um that detail the design process and i have captions on a lot of them uh, describing what i was thinking as i was doing them um and so you get to see where I'm designing the stand, um, designing the interior and thinking about having to route cables through it, how to house the uh, microchips and so on that need to to power the electronics. Um, So there's an awful lot of uh, detail on that particular project available in this album, if you're interested in in the thought processes behind it. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Each part tells a story. Yeah. And what I'm actually looking for as I scroll through it, yeah, here we go, is when I actually printed the prototype for the first time. And I have some photos. Yeah, here. So this is the stage where um, I had, given that this is a, a passion project, I'm I'm working on it day by day. And, and I sort of am fueled by equal parts nerdiness and uh, panic that I'm going to get it wrong or I'm going to screw it up in some way. And to, as to, to try to push that panic down, I wasn't really checking uh, as I went that I would be able to fit this thing on the printer. Mm. And sure enough, when I tried to, to set it up for a print, it was not going to fit. And so I had to modify it then. You remember I was holding it by the front end and yeah. saying that's a part that slots on, but I can hold it. Well, the reason that part slots on is because it would not fit in the print volume. Yeah, and so yeah. I had to, to rejig the design of the ship and come up with a way for that to, to slot in. But uh, a combination of fitting this large object into the print volume, which is about 23 centimeters by 23 centimeters by, I think, 30 something centimeters in height, um, a combination of needing to fit it in that volume and also finding the best way to take advantage of the angles that the printer can print at and the way that those surfaces then come out in terms of the fidelity of detail on those surfaces. I ended up printing it at this very odd angle. And you can see in this picture, if you're watching the YouTube version, that the ship is at about 45 degrees across the the print bed. It's also tilted upwards at about, I don't know, 60 degrees. Um, And it is supported by this almost organic looking network of what look like roots. And that's a a support uh, material that the printer prints as it prints the ship. So that uh, this is another aspect that you kind of have to take into account when you're designing these things for printing. Gravity is going to take that hot plastic and pull it down. And so yeah. if you have unsupported parts of your model uh, that will be subject to gravity, those are going to get distorted. Mm. And so you have various ways to, uh, to support the model as it's being printed. And one of, the, one of my favorites is what's called tree supports, where the, the software that you use to translate your 3D model into those two-dimensional slices now, the software is called a slicer. Um, that software can algorithmically grow a tree of support to support any part that may be subject to the uh, to the the whims of gravity, mm-hmm. and so you get this very organic looking structure that comes out of it. And as the print went on, it was kind of thrilling to see. This is a good one here. Yeah, it really looks like a root of a tree. I, I yeah. personally didn't know about that. I thought that um, most people just print it like that and it stands. But yeah, when you get into designs like this, uh, it, it won't work on its own. Yeah, yeah. And so you need to be able to snap all of that off and uh, and clean up your model afterwards. But uh, to me, this looks like 
you know, the spaceship is emerging from some giant space plant that's trying to claw it back. <laughs> <laughs> and, how hard, and this is sorry, go on. Yeah, how hard is it to remove the roots of the plant from the actual design? <laughs> uh, it's designed so that when like the the software is designed to grow this tree so that it's reasonably solid uh, to take the weight. But when it actually touches the model, it does it in little pinpricks so that you can snap those off fairly easily mm -hmm. and then just wipe them clean. Because uh, I do so have a feeling that there's like a small shadow on one of the roots there. So it, it's kind of a little bit separated, right? This here? Uh, no, uh, a little bit further up here at the end of the root or, or at the V crossing of the root. Here? A little bit, yeah, here and the lower part as well. Oh, here, yeah. 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 So it is standing out from the bottom of the ship um, there because it doesn't need to support that area. That's a relatively flat area. And as the with the angle that the ship was sitting at at 60 degrees, it can support itself as long as the um, that section is flat and doesn't have any parts that stick out. But mm -hmm. once... So it's building on top of itself as it goes up and up and up and up. But if you have any details that then stick out, um, which would be sort of sitting, because this is the bottom of the ship that we're looking at, this would be, you know, hull plates or hatches or anything that uh, are proud of the surface, then that part at that angle might need to print separated from the hull to print like the, the leading corner of that. So it will grow a tree to just where it needs to be to support that leading corner. And then it will print inwards until it connects with the hull and then mm. carry on. So Amazing. It's, it's, it's clever software. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I really didn't need, didn't know that you need to use that. But now the more I think about it, I, I, I realize how necessary it actually is. Yeah. So that's another thing, like um, in terms of the the brass tacks and the, the cost of uh, of printing, you need to take into account that you're not just printing your model, you're also printing supports for your model mm -hmm. um, if, if they're necessary. Some models you can design to be self-supporting and you won't need to enable uh, the, the support tree at all. Um, but that, that support material, and particularly in this case where the ship has to print at such an odd angle to be at the scale that I designed it for, you need a lot of support material. So that's actually going to add material cost to your print and that's material you're going to end up hopefully recycling but for me at the moment i don't have a method to to recycle that into new filament so it goes in the recycling bin mm -hmm. okay. but uh yeah uh, can you give uh, us a little bit of an insight into the filament cost like what kind of sure. filaments are you using and how much does one one of these rolls that you have on your 3d printer uh cost yeah so uh, i generally get a kilogram of uh pla uh PLA is short for polylactide. And uh, here's a refill here. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I've been doing lately is I have reusable spools and I get these refill rolls that I can just slot onto the spool. There have been times that I've been tearing my hair out, but then once I hit upon the solution, it's another case of that kind of engineering satisfaction moment, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, yeah um, it's rewarding so, in its own way. So what do you do when, uh, I don't know, a design breaks or, sorry, something breaks in the printer and your design is suddenly halfway finished, something has gone mm. wrong. Is there a way to kind of like pull the printer back in the design to restart from like 5% back or yeah, you have to start all actually, over again? The nose end here, you can see that line that, yeah. that uh, divine division there that is not a, a detail on the model that's actually an artifact of exactly what you're talking about mm -hmm. um there was a part on the inside of the nose here where what i was talking about a moment ago where there's a detail that maybe sits proud and the corner of that prints before the part that connects it to the rest of the model uh, that actually happened here so this little box which is for the the nose that or sorry, the, the light that lights up the nose section there. Mm -hmm. And that, that light plugs into the back of that box. Okay. And uh, when that was printing, it was couched in support material. And uh, I wasn't concerned about it. But what actually happened was that the print head just happened to knock the topmost layer when it was passing by it. 
and because the support material only touches it in kind of very gentle ways it dislodged the uh the part of this now i should uh point out that it was printing at this angle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so that those are the, the horizontal layer lines then and so that edge in there was printing free of the rest of the structure but was only supported in the in the support material mm -hmm. and when the print head struck it and dislodged it it just shifted angle and when the print head came back again uh the now free section of that box got stuck between the print head and the rest of the model and made the print head jump oh. and then it, that happened on every subsequent pass and so when i came back in the morning it had printed it maybe another 50 or 60 layers since that had happened but every single layer had been separated by that bump oh. and so you had this mess of a uh, of filament just all over the room and i was like oh no <laughs> and i came up with a solution um did i come up with this myself no i didn't i uh, i found a, a youtube video for someone who had had this not specifically this issue, but the issue of a print failing partway through and you want to rescue it. And what you actually do is, uh, <laughs> it's kind of delightfully um, low key. You open the, the print instruction file that you would load onto the printer in a text editor. You okay. measure how high up the last good layer was in millimeters, and you find the closest um vertical instruction in the print file to that height and then you delete everything before that and you reload that file into the printer uh, so it goes directly to that height and resumes the and print ah uh, yeah 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 slick yeah 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 it's really slick isn't it and that's exactly what happened and it carried on and, and finished uh that's and good, it, good. it it was printing the nose section and the body at the same time and it was actually the uh, the nose I had to glue a bit because there was a little bit of separation there, but the body, yeah, I think it's. I don't even know if it'll show up because it's so hard to see now. But the the scar from that incident is actually here, but I I really don't think it's visible. Nope, can't see it. Yeah, so um, which is good. I yeah the uh, the scar is not not really visible here at all. Now that fix will often solve the problem for you but occasionally the uh sort of left and right and forward and back calibration of where the print head print head is over the print bed can get disturbed by whatever stopped the print and so when you resume it from that height again uh you can have a slight offset which can mm -hmm. be can ruin your print or sometimes you can fix it by breaking at that point and, and re-gluing it but um most of the time, you will have a successful print, um, even with, with an issue like that. Awesome. The Uncle Gold Podcast.